Okay, so we're just gonna get the screen shared here. All right, so let's get started here. Um, so I'm Dr. Aaron Stairs. I'm a physical therapist for, and I work for the Performance Republic Physical Therapy here in San Antonio, Texas. And uh, as part of my practice over the past few years, I've been collecting a lot of data and uh, working with a lot of patients who come in with, you know, a lot of headache, upper quarter kind of symptoms and pain. So whether that's dysfunction of, you know, mobility, strength, whatever the case may be, but most of the time it is pain relief that we are treating in the clinic. Um, and I am seeing quite a few uh, TMJ headache and kind of neck pain cases that are probably non-traditionally treated um, outside of the typical framework of physical therapy. Um, so that's kind of why I wanted to put this course together, um, really just to enhance the outcomes of our patients and really kind of create this bridge between the professions of dentistry and physical therapy. Um, so this is our presentation on postural occlusal integration, um, exploring the connection between postural stability, temporal mandibular dysfunction, and occlusion. So with this course, we're really looking to get five core concepts down. And the first one is the asymmetrical structure of the body. Second being regional interdependence, mobility and stability, repetitive motions and prolonged postures, and then going into what we call functional dentistry, evaluation and treatment considerations with a PT-minded approach before you get into your dental work and uh, how that two-way street really integrates between the dental profession and the PT profession, depending on where the patient enters the healthcare process, okay? So if we can get through those, we're gonna kind of go into a lot of detail. This is gonna be a jam packed with information. So just try and keep up the best we can here. And again, I'm available anytime for, for questions afterwards. All right, so let's get into the asymmetrical structure of the body, right? All of our body is shifted to one side in the movement perspective. And what I mean by that is that we have a very asymmetrical function of our body, right? Our organ system is completely different on the right side than it is the left side, right? On that left side, we've got our heart. That's going to stop the, uh, the diaphragm underneath it from excreting up and down. Obviously, our liver also is going to stop that function. Now, breath obviously is a vital function. And if we actually look, and I'm going to show you a picture in a minute, but if we look at our diaphragms, our right diaphragm is about three times the size in its attachment to the spine as the left side. Now that's by design because this predisposes our center of gravity to shift to the right. It's almost like a spring, right? It comes us onto our right side and that gives us the elastic energy to then move onto our left side. Okay. So as humans genetically and anatomically, we are predisposed to moving our center of gravity to the right side. Now, this natural phenomenon is the basis of all movement. Okay. It is a very normal thing. Loading to the right side, like I said, creates this stored elastic energy that allows us to then spring onto our left side as we walk from right to left. The problem is that subconsciously, our body's natural goal is to conserve energy at all costs. Okay, so this means that as humans, we tend to rely on this passive motion to the right side and stay here. We don't want to get to our left side. Naturally, we want to be over here. Problem is, we spend too much time on this side and don't shift on to our left. Problems arise, compensations happen, right? And these effects trickle all the way down the chain to our feet and trickle all the way up through our thoracic spine, neck, cranium, and TMJ. So it's super important to kind of understand these dynamics and how it affects the dental profession as well as the PT profession. Now, this kind of phenomenon of being stuck, quote unquote, on your right side is the basis of pretty much 90, I would say 90% of all non-traumatic orthopedic things that we see in the clinic, right? If there's not like an injury that occurred, like you got hit by someone or you, know, you had a car crash, whatever the case may be, right? If it's non-traumatic, these out of nowhere pains, all of a sudden I woke up with my back started and oh, my shoulders hurt today, I don't know why. Those type of pains, I would venture to say upwards of 90, probably closer to 95% of those has its root in this dynamic of being on the right side for too much, okay? And all of the secondary things that 
compensate from that position. So if someone is spending too much time on their right or doesn't shift optimally to their left side, we in the PT profession diagnose that as being in a patterned state, okay? And those knock-on effects, like we said, go up and down the chain, okay? Dysfunction, this dysfunction in itself starts super early in development. You know, we've, we've had significant research and I will cite studies at the very end of all of this, uh, but we have significant amounts of research saying that these type of dysfunctions happen as early as kindergarten because this is what happens in kindergarten is a postural shift. It's the first time in a child's life where they have to sit for a significant amount of time throughout their day. And that's where we get reliant and lazy. We don't rely on our core stability. We don't move as often as we should. And we fall prey to this right-sided pattern, okay? Now, why is that important for the dental profession? If we look at like the, the genesis of, of your you know, tooth eruption, if functional changes are happening as early as four or five years old, that's gonna affect the force vectors that are going through your body. It's gonna affect the compensation and the muscles that you use throughout your day, right? And all of these things are then going to affect tooth development, jaw development, alignment and structure of the neck, cranium and TMJ. But we don't diagnose these things typically until adulthood. So this leaves 10, 20, 30, 40 years of falling into this pattern. And then we see all of the malocclusions. We see the terrible bites. We see these kind of terrible changes in TMJ function. We're not able to open our jaws as well as we should or lateral intrusion or protruded or retruded at some point in time, right? We see all these kind of, um, you know, all these dysfunctions. But these are years in the maintain. They don't really come out of nowhere, right? And sure, do teeth erupt randomly? Sure, they can. But most of our joint compensations and a decent amount of our malocclusions are due to form and function underneath it, right? The form of our jaw, the arch, our dental arch, is predisposed to you know, uh, develop secondary to the function of the body that underlies it. And if that function is dysfunctional for 20, 30, 40 years, there's no wonder that our, occlus our occlusion is, is off, right? Our arch may be off in those cases. So a big kind of concept in the PT world that we really need to grasp is mobility and stability, right? Mobility being the ability to produce motion, stability being the ability to withstand force. Stability will always precede mobility. If our body does not feel stable, we're not going to reach out into the world with motion, right? Our body's gonna lock us down because we don't feel safe, okay? Now this is driven neuromuscularly by the brain. The brain controls all movements. And if our brain does not feel safe with our body, we're not gonna move very well, okay? And what's one of the biggest forces that we need to stabilize against throughout our day? It's the force of gravity, right? And if we breathe however many thousands of times in a week, right? How many times are we shifted onto our right side? And how much are we just kind of relaxing on the side as opposed to using our muscles to overcome the force of gravity? If you see this picture on the left side here, you see the yellow lines here. This is called, uh, it's another slide we're gonna get into called regional interdependence in a minute, but this is basically the structural needs our body has at a joint by joint approach. Now, if we start down at the foot, our foot needs to be very stable, but our ankle is meant to be mobile. Our knees are meant to be stable. Our hips are meant to be mobile. And this alternating pattern happens throughout our body. This is a very well-known orthopedic concept in physical therapy. Funny thing is too with this, and we're going to get a little deeper in a little while into this concept, but neuromuscularly, our brain recognizes these patterns and will compensate because of this. Okay. Our body likes to follow the path of least resistance or least energy expenditure to withstand gravity in our daily activities. So along the way, if we're stuck on this right side, maybe we lack mobility where we are supposed to have it. And that puts a second layer of dysfunction on top of just being in this right-sided stance. You may lack hip mobility. You may lack thoracic spine mobility, neck mobility, right? 
the, the body recognizes these patterns neuromuscularly. And if there's an area of mobility that's lacking or an area of stability that's lacking, mobility may increase to or decrease to make up for that. The body is so weird with all these different thousands of combinations of compensations that it can particularly it can take. And that's the fun part of, for me, being a physical therapist is really kind of diagnosing if we have a mobility issue or a stability issue and what is the root cause of that elsewhere in the body, right? 99% of the time, if I'm treating pain, that pain is coming from somewhere other than the source of that pain. If someone's coming with TMJ pain, 99% of the time, the TMJ is not the issue, right? The neck, the shoulder, the thoracic spine, maybe even the hips could be an issue. Maybe even the feet, as far-fetched as that sounds, may be an issue, causing the jaw to lock up. So again, just to review, we're predisposed as humans to be on this right side. As we can see in this, in the, in this picture here, we're leaning into our right side, onto our right hip. This causes all of this dysfunction going on. Up the chain. Right. Now, if we look at stability itself, because stability is the most important base topic here, we have five major stability sensors throughout our body. Our feet, our core being our lumbopelvic region, our neck, and then our TMJ. We also can throw the vestibular system in there, but we're not going to get into that today. Okay. Now, if we lack stability somewhere in those areas, right? Most time as a physical therapist, I see people lacking stability in their core or lacking stability in their feet. Okay. If we lack stability there, our body's going to try and gain that stability somewhere else. Now, most of the time, the adjacent areas, like the hip or the ankle are going to stop moving because you're trying to create stability. But what we typically see, and there's a very high correlation, we'll kind of go into those studies in a little bit, but there's a very high correlation between lack of stability at the feet and significantly increased stability at the neck and the jaw. Why does that happen? Our body is trying to sense something, is trying to ground itself against gravity so we can start to move. If we don't have that sense of stability from our feet or our core, our neck is going to tense up. Our shoulders are going to get really tense. We're going to start clenching. We're going to brux. We're going to tongue punch, right? We're going to try and find a way to increase stability, to just have the sense of being, hey, I'm alive on this planet and I can stay stable against the force of gravity. And if my foot and my core is not doing that, my neck and my jaw are going to do that. It's kind of a crazy thing to think about if we haven't thought about that already, right? Where does this kind of sense of clenching and this tightness come from? There's your answer. A lack of stability throughout the body. The TMJ in your dental arch is part of the orthopedic system. We need to look away from the neck and shoulders and head to find out where the real problem is. And as a, you know, as a physical therapist, right, as a licensed orthopedic specialist in physical therapy, I can tell you that the vast majority of my clients, if they're lacking stability or they're lacking motion somewhere, it's mainly because they're lacking stability either in their core or in their feet. And you'd be shocked at the amount of times that someone comes in with a shoulder or a neck issue, I'm treating feet. No difference for dentistry. And we're going to get into this, this strange concept, this crazy, wacky concept of dentists checking feet during your evaluation. Okay, so on top of all this, a lot of information to go over, right? But as, uh, as we think about all of this, really factor in that right-sided shift, right? If we have this right-sided shift and we have a lack of stability in our core because of that, because we're not using our core to get from side to side, we're actually going to use our right jaw to clench down and create all of this bruxism or even, you know, this just overly clenched or this overused master temporalis or even just kind of like sternocleidomastoid, right? All of this is going to tense because we're typically shifted onto our right side. Now, all these forces over time will set up occlusal changes throughout adolescence to adulthood where we finally identify malocclusion when that person walks into your office and they have TMJ pain or they have something going on in their neck or they have headaches, right? 
and then come and see the dentist and you know you ask part of your routine evaluation hey you know what else is going on do you have any pain here can you open your jaw it pops is that painful yeah that's painful right okay cool let me go ahead and treat that let's hold on a second let's make sure we understand everything else underneath it all right so let's look over our compensations here one of our other core concepts so we're going to kind of dive a little bit into kind of how the body leads into these compensation patterns and how it all plays together biomechanically. Um, so it really just starts off with our musculoskeletal system is driven by our diaphragmatic connections to the lumbopelvic region. Okay. First thing we do when we're alive is breathing. Before we even move, we have to learn to breathe. Breathing because of the attachments of the diaphragm to the lumbar spine predispose us to shifting to our right side. Compensations then occur because we become over-reliant on our natural right-sided shift, and then we gain a lack of stability or a lack of mobility. Now, posture is dynamic, right? Posture is not this singular thing of sit up straight. That's not what we do for posture. Posture is a dynamic thing, and we can't just look at one point. Posture, poor posture is actually defined as spending too much time in one position, not the position itself. The position itself is not the problem. It's the time we spend in those positions that's the problem, right? So being on this right side, not a problem. Spending 75% of your day here, that's a problem, right? And again, most orthopedic movement-based pain and dysfunction is rooted in this compensation. That includes TMJ, TMD issues, and occlusal patterning. We need to treat the source when someone comes in to see us as a dentist or a physical therapist, right? We need to treat the source of the pain. Someone comes in and says, I got TMJ pain, I got jaw pain. We're going to treat the jaw. We're going to make it feel better, right? We've got plenty of techniques to decrease pain. But that pain's going to come back if we don't treat the underlying root cause of pain and dysfunction of the TMJ, which the vast majority of the time is going to be a lack of stability somewhere in the system. So this is that regional interdependence that we talked about, we touched on it earlier, right? Regional independence is that one area of the body can affect another. It's really all that means. And this is the system, these little bullets here. This is the knock-on effect that we see where the core or the feet can affect the jaw. So just so I'm not making stuff up, right? Anatomy textbooks will show this. Here's the underside of the diaphragm. The diaphragm connects into that lumbar spine. Look how massive that tendon is on the right side there compared to the left. That's what causes that rotation and that shift onto our right side every single time we breathe. Now, what does that do to our lumbar spine and our pelvis here? If we shift to the right, if this is your pelvis, this is the right, this is the left. If we shift to our right, our right pelvis rotates into a posterior position. Seen on that picture right there, okay? That's also gonna twist our tailbone and shift our hips and our ball and socket joints of our hips, okay? Now, just quickly looking at how that looks down the chain, if we shift this way, our hips are gonna then turn into an internally rotated position, an adducted position. For those dentists who are here who used to be athletes, this is what was going into what's called a knee valgus position where the knee collapses in. Very big reason why ACL tears and you know, meniscus tears in the knee happen for, for those athletes out there. Problem is, if we have these legs that were coming in and knocking our knees together, we're gonna knock our knees every time we take a step. So our body's smarter than that and says, oh, I've still got a tibia underneath that and we're gonna turn that tibia out. That's also gonna cause ankle pronation or flat footedness. People who have Achilles tendonitis issues, plantar fascial issues, right? Calf strains, hamstring strains, groin strains, low back pain, all of these things have a root cause of the exact same movement pattern. It's this right here, okay? Now, why is this important? If this position collapses our foot, we no longer have foot stability. We no longer have foot stability. Our brain recognizes that and says, hey, I need the stability sensors to bear down here, make up for my lack of a foot. That might be neck tension, that might be jaw tension, that might just be just lacking mobility in the neck, not lacking mobility elsewhere in the body, right? In the ankle. All of these different compensations happen and they're somewhat random, 
but not really, right? They're predictable patterns, but depending on your body, your brain may say, lock up the neck. Tommy's brain may say, lock up the ankle, right? That part we don't really have much control over. But that's the cool stuff about orthopedics here that we don't really get into, which is fascinating. I can talk about this stuff for hours. All right, so let's forget about the lower body for a second and work up the chain. So again, we think about the diaphragm attachments and the pelvic compensations. What does that do up the chain into the thorax and the rib cage? Well, this is what we'll typically see here. Now, this is an over-exaggeration, but this is typically the pattern that we see. This man is shifted to his right side. His right shoulder is dipped down like this, okay? That's typically what we'll see. That's going to hike that left side up, and it's also going to do a little side bend at the neck, okay? The left side bend. This is the position. Now, people aren't going to look like this. People are going to probably more look like this, right? It's a little bit more subtle. But that compensation right there, especially if my hands are being the shoulder blades here, right? That right shoulder blade goes down. All of the muscles that attach from the shoulder blade into the neck, and there are so many of them, then become loaded and locked locked and loaded into this tight position. This tight, tense position then pulls on the neck, creates additional stability compensations and pain. This is a painful process. Now, side note here, because us as PTs and us as dentists, we are not immune to this ourselves. How many dentists listening to this right now have right-sided or even left-sided neck pain, shoulder pain, or even like that little kind of trap area right here. It's like, oh man, I'm sore after a long day's work, right? If you're right-handed, it's probably gonna be your right side. Well, think about it. If you are in this position naturally because you're sitting a lot of time as a dentist in that chair doing your work, your right shoulder blade is probably lower or depressed compared to the left side. That's gonna put all that tension through that right side what are you trying to do most of the time when you're doing your dental work? If you're right-handed, you're bringing your right shoulder over to work in someone's mouth. You're having to fight this position to even get your work done. And we wonder why we have so much tension and pain as dentists getting into these positions, especially the shoulder pain, neck pain, elbow pain, or even headaches and jaw pain. It's because of this position. And if we can do some corrective exercise and some hands-on work to get this reversed and not spend as much time here, pain will go away. It's fascinating. So let's move up from here. From the thorax here, this position and this right side here can also predispose us to something called upper cross syndrome. Okay. Now we're in this position more on the right than the left, but then we sit a lot, right? When we're sitting throughout the day, we're anteriorly oriented. Our shoulders are always rolling forward. We're always here typing at our desk, reaching forward, right? That rolls our, full, our shoulders forward, our back rounds. So this is something very common in the physical therapy world that we see posturally called upper cross syndrome. This ultimately becomes tightness in our upper traps and levator scapulae, tightness in our pecs, but then it's also weakness in our mid back, in our, in our low trap area and our serratus interior area. It's also weakness in our throat muscles, our deep neck flexors, our longest coli and things like that, right? Our SCMs. All of this becomes really, really kind of just weak, okay? Now, why does that become an issue for dentists? Why do you need to know that? You'll see in this picture right here, patients come in with this posture. And as a complete side note for dentistry, this upper cross syndrome is highly, highly associated with acid reflux and GERD and tooth decay and erosion and pain. Because if you're in this position and you've got acid reflux, Tums isn't gonna help you, right? Your, your medicines aren't gonna help you until you get out of this position. Align the GI tract correctly to where it no longer has to reflux and you can get away of that acidic environment throughout your throat, esophagus, into your, into your mouth for that tooth erosion. Pretty cool. All right, we're moving up the chain again into the cervical spine, so into the neck. So we're in this right shifted position. Our right shoulder is down. Our left side, we're left side men. 
what does that do to our upper cervical spine in particular, our OA joint, right? Our occipital lantal joint. Our atlas, right? This is a kind of C2 area right here. Our atlas on the right side is going to shift up if we're at a left side bend. We're here and here. This is kind of where we're at in this kind of position with the, being on the right side. That's going to shift our atlas in our neck to the right going up. Okay. What does that do? Elevates and closes the space right here in the suboccipital area. There's a lot of nerves in that area. There's a lot of muscles, right? Your suboccipital muscles. All of that can become tensed, shortened, and even pinched on those nerves in response to being in this right side down, left side bent position. This is super important to grasp too. We think our hands are dexterous. Our hands have 16 grams of muscle spindles, oh sorry, 16 muscle spindles per gram of muscle in your hand. That makes us pretty dexterous. Our suboccipitals have 200. That means our suboccipital muscles are 10 times more dexterous to movement or sensitive to movement, I should say, compared to your hand is dexterous. It's pretty incredible, right? This is a super important area, not only for holding your head up straight in a good position, but also just living life without having to clamp down on your TMJ. If this area is sensing that something's off, everything here is going to tense in response, right? That tension can lead to kind of some common compensation patterns, limited cervical rotation, neck rotation, limited mandibular protrusion, lateral intrusion to either side, and even limit mandibular opening. 72% okay. of patients with TMD or TMJ dysfunction have cervical rotation limitations. That's why it's so important to check cervical, limita cervical limitations in the right plane of motion. We're going to show you how to do that in a little bit. Now, this is also associated with neck pain, facial pain, TMJ pain, and headaches. Every so often in this area, instead of a tightness, this area becomes more loose. It doesn't happen very often. It's a very rare compensation pattern, but sometimes that does happen. I've seen it maybe once in my career, personally. I was just reading it in books. And in that case, I was, require, I was requiring the help of a dental orthotic to help create stability here. So again, that's the 0.001% of compensation that may happen. So we're actually going to uh, not worry about that so much, but I think it is of note to say that this is just another way that the PT and the dental professions can really collaborate and make great outcomes for our patients. All right, so we've gotten through compensations through the thorax, the neck, and now we're moving into the suboccipital and the cranium, okay? So these regional interdependence forces are rippling through the body, and these forces are then pushed through to the, to the cranium. Now, obviously, there's multiple bones in our skull, and they're all sewed together by these sutures, correct? Obviously, suture formation and suture kind of uh, calcification happens over time, right? But we always maintain a little bit of wiggle room and movement throughout our sutures of our skull. These sutures could kind of uh, maintain stored energy, right? Now, this stored energy is sensed by the suboccipitals, and to get away from excessive energy, force and tension through our skull, our body goes into this forward head position to relieve it. Okay. Think back to that upper cross syndrome we talked about a little bit ago. That's part of this dynamic, right? Forward head to get away from the tension in the suboccipitals and the tension in the skull. But then that's, a, it's just trying to compensate, right? That's all we're trying to do is get away from this tension. Now, this store tension has the biggest effect on a part of your skull called the sphenobasilar synchondrosis, the SBS, okay? Not to go too far into the biomechanics of what's going on with the forward head posture, but if you are shifted anteriorly or extended in your upper cervical spine, 
that is then going to cause a relative sphenobasilar flexion, okay? Got our OA joint, our basilar area, our, our, our base of our skull right here, right? And then we've got our sphenoid deep into the face coming from posterior to anterior. If we extend here, relatively this part here and that sphenoid is going to flex, okay? And what that will end up doing to the temporal bones is flaring. Okay, now this is all relative because of the steroid energy. This is millimeters of function that we're talking about here. Okay, but that millimeters of function and change is going to change the stored energy capacity and tension through those sutures, which will reinforce this forward head position. That's a lot <laughs> of word vomit that I just threw up on you guys. But just to kind of think about the biomechanics and why this is important, how this actually happens. Okay, now. Another side note, this can actually cause sinus shifts inside of our face, inside of our skull, right? And to show you how much of a pattern, how common this pattern is, there's a great study of rhinoplasty patients. 88% of rhinoplasty patients have a wider left sinus, crural cartilage, and alar base. So what that means is their face is shifted to the right with the rest of their body as their jaw shifts as well. That opens up that left sinus. 88%. That's not coincidence. That is just anatomical function and not being able to overcome being on your right side because of stability and postural demands of gravity. Facial characteristics, someone who's patterned, right, in a pattern state on their right side, their face is going to follow form. This is what you're going to see. You're going to see a right side facial bulge. Their right side is going to look bigger. Their eyes and their chin are going to be canted from right to left. You're going to see what appears to be a larger and elevated right orbit. You may see a visibly flared left ear. Don't worry about this picture with the line across her chin, right? We're just looking at this picture on our left, okay? You're going to see a bigger right nostril opening and potentially a right higher eyebrow, okay? Now, with this person, if we ask them to open their jaw, this is someone who maybe can't get very good mandibular opening. And so to compensate for that, they're going to turn their chin to try and struggle through it to try and get a little bit more opening. That's why it looks a little bit different on this left picture than the right when we get a functional picture, just a snapshot of the motion. All right, so let's get into the TMJ compensations here, right? If you're still with me following a lot from what's happened here. This same compensation pattern being on the right side, right shoulder depressed, left side bend, is then going to cause the right TMJ to be what we call deep or elevated into that socket right there. The left is going to be distracted and shallow or depressed on the left side. So we have this little jaw shift right here. Now again, fairly normal of a motion, right? You gotta be from here to here as you're chewing from side to side in your TMJ to get posterior bite or occlusion on this right posterior molars and then shifting over to the left. That jaw does have to wiggle a little bit to do that, right? We don't want bilateral posterior contact at the same time while we're chewing, right? We want one side bigger, one side, or one side kind of contacting, one side open. Problem is if we spend too much time here on one side, that becomes patterned, painful, because we're not spending time on our other side or we're not able to shift to the other side, okay? Again, this is gonna be limited mandibular movement, TMJ pain, neck pain, orbital pain can occur from this and headaches. Then what ends up happening and locking us in place long-term here is our SCMs. We get stuck here, everything gets tight. These SCMs recognize that, our neck recognizes that and says lock down. And you see even in this picture, the outline of our SCMs on both sides locking and being overly tight and overly used in these positions. And that leads us to the occlusion. 
the bite, right? The arch. So obviously you don't need me as a PT to lecture you on malocclusion, right? <laughs> but what I will say, dysfunction, again, is overwhelmingly driven by the brain. Form, including the dental arch and occlusions, the vast majority of the time follows the orthopedic function of our body throughout our development from adolescence to adulthood, okay? Now, again, you guys already know this, but ideally, maxillary lingual cusps for occlusion should articulate with the central fossa of mandibular teeth. Something goes away from that, then we have class two or class three, right? Something like that. But we got to think, why do these malocclusions happen in the first place? Is it just that the tooth erupted into a weird angle? Maybe. That happens. More logically, it's because of the lack of stability somewhere else in our body and our neck and our jaw compensating for that lack of stability throughout the entirety of our lives, right? This is where occlusal preference occurs. People like to chew on one side compared to the other. This is where tongue punching occurs, right? Whether that's laterally or anteriorly. This is where bruxing and clenching and SCM tightness and masseteral tightness and uh, temporalis tightness occurs because of these postural positions of not being able to get off or this over-reliance of being shifted to the right. Okay. Now, this is a two-way street, right? I'm coming at this lecture from posture affecting the, the bite, right? But it does work the other way. You know, at a certain point in time, even though we know that stability requirements change form, you know, follows function. Once that form has been changed and you see all this, you know, malocclusion and kind of other things that you're looking for aesthetically, right, with these kind of torsions and, you know, and all these different kind of open bites and things and overcrowding things that you might see in a dental evaluation, we are maybe able to overcome that in the orthopedic world. And I've seen that multiple times where I've worked on someone's neck, I've done everything I can posturally, and maybe they get a little bit of improvement, but they're not there. At that point in time, I need to refer to a dentist so that they can overcome the occlusal differences or the bite, the, what's wrong with their bite. Maybe they're not able to get posterior molar occlusion alternately when they're chewing. Maybe their canine guidance is off, right? Their reference is off there. They maybe can't feel what's going on with that. And I can't do anything about that as a PT. That's where it's essential for a dentist to come in and step in and do your thing so that we can get the stability requirements we, we need through the jaw that I couldn't do otherwise because it's a structural thing at that point in time. The amount of times that I've struggled to get someone to get full range of motion in their neck through traditional PT means, referred them to a dentist, they've gotten their bite taken care of, and then they have full range of motion afterwards. It's powerful stuff, it's really powerful stuff. I'm even talking, when I talk work, work with my professional baseball players, a lot of time with professional baseball players, they have to have excessive amounts of external rotation as they go to throw, and they've gotta be able to maintain internal rotation here. Because of this kind of same thing, jaw gets tight on the right side, they lose internal shoulder rotation because of this jaw being off. And sometimes I can get massive improvements in internal rotation of the shoulder without even touching the shoulder by just working on the TMJ and getting a posterior bite to alternate from right to left. If I can't do that through functional means, I'll refer out to a dentist. Then we put an orthotic in. And once they have the orthotic, they now have the sense of posterior bite. Once they've got that sense, guess what happens automatically? It's ridiculous. It's magic what happens, right? So what else? occurs with this two-way street, right? We talked about kind of that posterior bite that we just talked about. We talked about the TMJ and all this kind of positions, but this two-way street where posture affects occlusion and vice versa. Some of these studies that have come out, and again, I will cite these studies at the very bottom here. 40% um, of class twos and multiple studies have found a correlation to over supinated feet. 50% of class threes are correlated with overpronated feet. Protrusion of the jaw is correlated with the flat back. 
or overly extended spine. Retrusion is correlated with that forward head posture and upper cross syndrome. Anterior open bites related to chronic upper trap and levator scap activity. Posterior open bites are typically because of a chronic mandibular lack of stability or inability to get from right to left to be able to get alternating bite from side to side. And this is where we have to work together in these professions, right? In between PT and dentistry to be able to figure out where is the root cause coming from? Is this a jaw top down issue or is this a bottom up issue posturally? Just something to think about. Last one that I didn't mention there, overcrowding, wherever that overcrowding may occur is a high correlation with limited neck motion in any direction. And again, two way street. Right. Did the neck motion, lack of neck motion occur because of the overcrowding or did the overcrowding occur because of the limited neck motion? It's going to be a case by case basis, but we need to know that our treatment can't be the same for either of those things. So ultimately, from my opinion, right, or my practice, Right, my, my structure of my sessions, what am I looking for orthopedically with the goal here at the TMJ and with occlusion when it comes to posture? I want alter, uh, the ability to be there for alternating posterior molar contact. Because one of the things that I assess for every single time that I'm looking at posture and balance and, and gait mechanics for walking, right? Because when you shift to your right side, you're able to get a more clear right posterior bite. When you shift to the left, optimally how you should move as a human, you're more likely to get a left posterior bite, and the ability to get that occlusion. Somewhere along the way, if you can't shift from right to left, you lose occlusion on one side. More often than not, you lose it on the left and only can occlude posteriorly on those molars on the right. But why do we want alternating occlusal ability? Well, one, obviously, it's the correlation to show that hey, I can move from side to side. But also, we're trying to achieve sensory awareness through the periodontal ligaments of the maxilla. That's important for proprioception. That's important for movement. If we don't have that bite, especially in the posterior molars, we're not going to get the stimulation of something called the sphenopalatine ganglion. And that's what's pictured right here, this massive bundle of nerves that parasympathetically relaxes our body when it's stimulated. If we're only getting contact on one side posteriorly, we're not getting stimulation on the other side. If we're not getting alternate stimulation, our body is going to be stuck in a sympathetic state of being, an inflammatory state of being, a tense state of being. We have to be able to load and unload both sides. It is a key correlating factor to human movement. So before we do any kind of dental work, we want to be able to make sure that we have this to maintain and restore orthopedic correlations with movements. The amount of times that I've seen something crazy, like someone's left hip doesn't move very well. And I go through traditional PT and they get a little bit better. As soon as I start working on alternate bite, their mobility restores. I kid you not. It is incredibly powerful being able to get this alternate boy, this alternate boy is alternate bite. Okay. So again, the sphenopalatine ganglion is huge. It's massive for orthopedic integrity. Okay. It's also a lead driver of pain in the face, jaw, TMJ, right? And even into headaches. So if we can get stimulation of it on both sides, that's going to eradicate pain. Now, what's stopping us from getting from side to side? Sometimes it's these postural functions, right? Being stuck on this right side, I can include here, 
can't get to this left side until I learn to get to this left side. I can't clench here until I learn to get to my left side. Okay. Sometimes I spent too much time here over the past 20, 30 years. I now have an open bite posteriorly or I have something going on with my occlusion or my contacts, right? Or, some, or something's off. And I need, I require the, the help of a dentist to optimize my bite so that I can feel that sense. Get over my clenching and bruxing on one side or my tongue punching so that I can be on that other side. Okay. The mandible is what stimulates the maxilla. The mandible doesn't move the maxilla, right? It just stimulates it through the periodontal ligaments. Super, super important. Now, typically we will see an overutilized right side and an underutilized left side. Okay. So again, this alternate occlusion of posterior molars keeps your sphenopalatine ganglion happy. So how can we true, how can we achieve this alternate occlusion? Can we do it through postural restoration in physical therapy? Can we do it through a mandibular orthotic? Can we achieve it through another dental procedure that's not my wheelhouse? That's how I that's what I would refer to you. Because I can't complete my plan of care sometimes without your help. Okay, there's a lot to think about. Really, really a lot to think about. So let's take a breather here and just kind of go over these kind of big topics one more time, right? The musculoskeletal system is driven by diaphragmatic connections to the lumbopelvic region. Compensations occur due to the over-reliance of the natural right shift of the body and the secondary lack of mobility and stability. Posture is dynamic, not a singular position. So if we spend too much time in one position, that's when posture affects function and affects structure. Now, most orthopedic and movement-based pain and dysfunction is rooted in this right-sided shift compensation pattern. That will include TMJ dysfunction and occlusal pattern. We have to treat the source, otherwise known as the location of our pain, right? Someone comes in for with TMJ pain, we're gonna you know, do some stuff with the TMJ directly to get it to calm down. But we also have to look at the root cause of this pain and dysfunction. And most of the time, Orthopedically, that compensation is from a lack of stability in our core and in our feet. We lack foot stability or lack, lack foot position. We lack pelvic position or core stability. Our neck and our TMJ are gonna lock down. And that's gonna affect our dental work. That's gonna affect the canvas at which you do your dental artistry. We have those five stability centers of our body, the feet, the core, the neck, the TMJ, and the vestibular system, right? But ultimately we need to figure out how to disperse stability throughout our body so that we're not over-reliant on a clench, a masseteric compensation, a temporalis constant, uh, uh, compensation, or a SCM compensation, okay? That in itself is going to get rid of pain in the TMJ. It's gonna improve function of opening and our lateral protrusion, protrusion, our bite angles before we even look at teeth. I'm not talking dentistry here. We're just talking jaw mechanics. Again, on top of like the tightness we just talked about, clenching, bruxing, tongue punching, they're all cries for stability elsewhere. And if we've learned to do that from an early age, Guess what, 20, 30 years down the line in adulthood, when we see our new dentist for the first time, they're gonna be like, holy crap, look at your arch, it looks terrible, right? I'm not gonna say that to a patient, but that's what you're gonna be thinking. Why did that happen? A lack of stability in some cases. Okay, so 
what do we start? How do we start to affect this, right? In the physical therapy profession, how do we affect TMD or occlusal dysfunction? Well, there are five main habits that we see day in, day out that build up to being a, you know, a big effect on, on, on this, on, on this uh, system. First thing we have to look at is our breathing mechanics. If we have poor diaphragmatic function, if we don't breathe into our diaphragm, we're gonna upregulate our secondary muscles of inspiration, namely our sternocleidomastoids, right? Our muscles, our elevator scapulae, our muscles around our neck and shoulders. Those muscles are not meant to be breathing muscles. They're meant to assist in breathing, but they're not meant to primarily breathe. So that could be a reason why these muscles are so stiff and kind of locked down and painful, our upper trap as well, okay? So we kind of, as physical therapists, you know, how I would treat that is I would need to work, basically reteach someone how to breathe correctly. You'd be shocked at the amount of time I spend teaching people to breathe correctly throughout the day. The second thing we need to look at is our, our chewing pattern when we eat. Subconsciously, we typically have a preference of chewing on one side compared to the other. More often than not, because we're shifting onto our right side, we have a preference to chew on our right side. So just the conscious habit of trying to chew more often on our opposite side than we're used to is going to have an improved effect or a, a, an improved outcome on pain and dysfunction in the jaw, head, and neck. Third thing that we look at from a habit standpoint is sleeping, right? Side and stomach sleeping will reinforce poor postural positions, okay? I highly recommend the vast majority of people to sleep on their backs in physical therapy. This is what you should also be telling your patients. Don't be a side sleeper, be a back sleeper if you can, okay? Work setup is going to be huge especially in today's you know, work environment where most of us are, the vast majority of humans in America are in front of a screen all day long in their computer. If their desktop is not right in front of them and their monitor is off to the side and they're here turning to one side all day long, that's gonna affect the neck and TMJ mechanics and reinforce these bad patterns. We need to have a neutral desk setup. And then the big one is lack of exercise and movement. All right. It's in, we know it's important for our cardiovascular health, but you know, it's also important for our orthopedic and pain health, right? Specific programs to limit dysfunction and progress to regular training and working out. That's really what we need to get to. Now, with this course, you are getting a one page handout that you can print off and give to all your clients so that you can have these habit recommendations because not everyone's going to do all of this, right? But you need to be able to identify these environmental factors that are these habits that your patients are reinforcing day in, day out that are going to negatively impact our pain and negatively impact our outcomes for our procedures. Okay. So just something to think about there. All right. So with everything that we've gone over, you probably have a pretty good understanding at this point in time of how the body all acts together as one orthopedic system. Isolation is not a thing in orthopedics. Isolating muscle function is not a thing. Isolating sectors of the body, head and neck from the rest of the body is not a thing. It all happens together, okay? And it's a two-way street like we talked about. So how does this really affect dental practice, okay? Specifically in the realm of aesthetic, orthopedic, and you know, restorative dentistry, we should be looking at the bigger orthopedic picture other than the head and the neck, right? We need to restore neutrality and full expression of motion throughout the body before we even look at bite neutrality, right? How many of us are, are, are looking at a bite, right? Seeing the lineup of our, of our, of our teeth, right? And seeing, again, forgive me, I'm not a dentist, <laughs> but looking at kind of the alignment without even considering if one shoulder is lower than the other or a neck is side bent. 
what happens if you're just treating the teeth and treating the arch and the bite without looking at the underlying base of that jaw? It's going to affect how we, how we deliver our treatments. PTs, likewise, need to focus more or at least have an understanding of occlusal contacts. And we need to enlist the help of dentists to create mandibular devices for us when we need them to provide improved stability of that alternating posterior molar contact that we talked about so frequently in this presentation. Now, you know, it's not our own fault, right? This connection between body and jaw and our dental arch is not taught in schools. It's rarely is it taught in continuing education courses, right? So it's not our fault. So it's just, we just need to recognize it. And if we are, you know, exposed to this information, we have to act on it. You, you can't walk away from this lecture and continue to treat the way you've been treating as a PT or a dentist, right? The vast majority of current TMJ and clenching treatments are passive in nature, right? I'm talking about like Botoxing the muscles that are clenching, right? Or the muscles that are overactive, putting in guards and splints and you know, contact shaping, all of that's great. And maybe you get some results, but ultimately if we're not fixing the underlying movement compensations, pain may not go away or our outcomes may be less than optimal because we didn't look at treating and putting ourselves in the most neutral position, or at least attaining these positions as close as we can before we do our dental work. If I'm always on my right side and I have pain and dysfunction and I do something in the jaw here, I've just locked myself into this side. Now I would definitely won't be able to shift to the left and get these alternating contacts that we need. Okay. Again, it's all well intended to treat pain, aesthetics, and function from both sides, the PT side and the dental side. But ultimately, we need both. Okay. Otherwise, these problems will resurface at a later date and because of that root cause of postural instability and lack of neutrality in our treatment in the setup. So let's talk about the patient journey, right? So where does this come into play? Because obviously in standard care, cleanings and things like that, obviously this does not come into play. But if someone comes to you in your dental office and they're complaining of TMJ issues, headaches, facial jaw, neck pain, this is where this comes into play. If the patient enters the healthcare realm and seeks a dentist first for this type of issue, we need to evaluate posture and function first before we do our typical dental evaluation. We need to refer to a PT so that significant postural and functional findings on the evaluation can be eliminated before starting the dental work. And from the PT side of things, PT should be referring to dentists more often, right? If the postural and functional activity that a PT is performing is not improving pain, then we need, to, or even improving function, we then need to refer to a dentist for evaluation of treatment to establish proper bite. Once we get that established, then PTs can then go back and do their treatment. So again, it's a two-way street, right? We just have to figure out where this patient is and what's going to benefit them the most. So you're probably wondering at this point, how do I perform a functional dentistry evaluation when it comes to integrating orthopedic concepts? So the first thing we need to talk about is just a few different positions for the evaluation. The evaluation starts in the, in the waiting room, right? We can look at someone's seated position in the waiting room. Are they exhibiting a forward head posture when they're in the waiting room, right? Are they shifted to one side in their chair, right? These are things that you can pick up on straight away. When you ask them back from the waiting room and they're walking, you can check their walking. Most people, and it doesn't have to be like anything crazy. You don't need a massive um, amount of education to, to assess a gait pattern, right? All you're looking for is a big rock item of when they're walking, does it look like they shift from side to side, which they should do? Or are they just always kind of on one side? And even if they're stepping on their left, their body center of gravity is to the right. It's just a yes or no, right? 
Can we pick up on that? The other thing that you should do is check your patient's feet, okay? So if this is your patient's foot, we should have a little bit of an arch right here, right? If your patient's foot, take their shoes and socks off and they're standing and their foot is completely flat to the ground or their foot is collapsed inwards like this, rather than being here, it's collapsed inwards on the insides of their feet. Or if they're putting too much pressure on the outsides of their foot and they're not really putting full contact with the whole foot on the ground, you can automatically know that they have a lack of foot stability. You already know that without even doing any detailed PT assessment, you already can assume that confidently. Okay. And if they have a lack of foot stability, they're making up for that somewhere else. So if they've got neck tension, they got clenching, they got something going on with their TMJ, the complaints, and their feet are in a resting supinated or pronated position, that's screaming body for stability. Don't even worry about working on dental work at that point in time. Let's get the stability going first. Okay. Bringing them in at that point in time to the dental chair, we need to get them in a seated position, right? And we want to, again, assess, are they utilizing the headrest or is their head forward? Okay. You can then utilize the picture that we showed in the previous slide on the face shape to see if that face shape fits the bill of someone who's patterned. You can check out mandibular range of motion, right? You can do to your, all your TMJ palpation, assess for popping and clicking, right? And all that fun stuff. You can adjust for the normal range of motion of opening, protrusion, retrusion, lateral retrusion. And then you need to assess the ability to contact the posterior molars alternately from right to left. Can they do all of those things? This is a checklist, right? And if these things are adding up and the multiple things are here, and you know your next move, right? We're gonna still do the dental evaluation, but I need to refer you to a PT before we deliver treatment. Next thing you wanna do is lay that dental chair all the way flat, all the way flat and supine, right? At that point in time, again, are they exhibiting a forward head posture? Is their chin up to the ceiling, right? At that point in time, again, another postural compensation. Then you can cup your hands behind the back of their head so their head is relaxing on your hands and just passively take them into a rotation on both sides, passively take them into a side bend on both sides. Again, you don't need to know much about this. It's just a general screening, right? Is there pain elicited with those motions? Is there a reproduction of their symptoms? Is there a gross limitation? Now, what do I mean by gross limitation? You should, normal range of motion, be able to turn your head 90 degrees. So if this is zero, you should be able to get your nose over to your clavicle, right? 90 degrees of motion if your nose is the swivel point, right? If they can't get 90 degrees or there's a gross asymmetry, right? They got 90 degrees on one side and 45 on the other or 60 on the other. It's a big difference from side to side. At that point in time, you know you've got a neck postural compensation. That neck is locked up. The mobility is not there. There are orthopedic postural concerns there, okay? Again, the neck and the feet are so important, and they're huge windows to peer into the orthopedic health of your patient. So if we're seeing stability concerns in the neck, overly tight muscles, you can see these SCMs bulging out. You see lack of motion in their neck. You see these face shape characteristics. All right, they're patterned. They're stuck on their right side. They need to spend more time getting over onto our left side and go through a round of PT treatment to work on this, okay? Other question we need to pose here for functional dentistry. The typical evaluation that you do in a seated position in the dental chair, have you ever done the exact same or close to the exact same evaluation in a stand with your patient standing up. You're going to be shocked by the change in results or the change in what you see when someone is sitting versus when they're standing. It's not going to be the same. And a bite that looks perfectly fine or looks okay during a sitting position may look completely off when they get up into a standing position. 
Now, again, you got to assess for that patient, right? Are we treating the patient because we want them to be comfortable while they're sitting and be, you know, not using their bodies throughout the day? Or do we want their jaw, their dental arch, their bite to reflect function in a functional standing upright position? What's the importance there, right? The importance of overall health. Okay, so use that evaluation. Again, it's very simple stuff, right? And you can reference this. I'll have a one pager for you guys to follow that you can you know, reference from this, from this uh, presentation. But again, it's a checklist clearance, right? Prior to doing any kind of aesthetic or restorative or orthopedic work. If the dental work is done without optimally improving the postural compensations, we are locking our patients into this dysfunctional state because now their jaw, the, their structure has changed, but their function has not. And that's just gonna create more problems and compensations because form follows function. And if we change the form without changing the function, setting up for further compensations and, and worse results. Again, here, here we have another overview of what we would do in PT treatment, right? Local TMJ and occlusal mechanic program from a physical therapy standpoint, changing of habits, repetitive motions and prolonged postures, breathing mechanics training, postural restoration. So improving the lumbopelvic mechanics with the diaphragm, right? With the base of everything. Foot core series is another set, set of exercises again. All of this, you don't really need to worry about as a dentist, but this is the kind of things, the programs that we would have available as a physical therapist who get a referral from a dentist. Okay. And then from a dental appliances standpoint, right? Before we even do any work on teeth, can we create a mandibular orthotic or to create that molar occlusion that we're looking for? Once we improve that molar occlusion and we improve all of the functional deficits that that person is exhibiting in their body, pain should go away. Dysfunction should go away. And at that point in time, you are free to do whatever the heck we want to do with teeth, right? Because pain is no longer a factor. TMJ is no longer a factor. And we can work on the artistry of dentistry. All right. Awesome. I'm sure at this point in time, you guys are sick of hearing me go over the same thing over and over again. We're gonna go over one last time and these are all of the uh, resources we use for today's presentation. So feel free to peruse those if you'd like. A lot of this research comes from dental journals, not even PT journals, okay? So take home points one last time. Our bodies are asymmetrical and designed for lateralized movement from right to left, right to left. This lack of repetitive motion and an over-reliance on the natural right shift of our body leads to compensatory patterns of lack of mobility and stability throughout the body. That includes the TMJ and occlusal mechanics. Dysfunctional patterns or being a pattern individual is exacerbated or, you know, progresses in this position because of the chronic lack of stability. Neck pain, headaches, TMJ, occlusal problems, clenching, bruxing, tongue punching, these are all primary issues with an underlying root cause of lack of stability somewhere else in the body. Your brain is just saying, I need to feel a sense of groundedness. If I'm not getting it from my feet and my core, I'm gonna get it from my neck and my jaw and my occlusion. So before we even think about treating the teeth, we need to make sure the system and the base that the dental arch sits on is sound. PT treatment could be ineffective for restoring function. And that would be because the problem is not the function at that point in time, the function is the structure. No, sorry, the problem is the structure, okay? When PT treatment is ineffective, we need to refer to a dentist for occlusal treatments or whatever dental work in your wheelhouse that you think needs to be done 
because at that point in time, the structure is causing the pain, not the function. Okay. Our ultimate goal before starting any dental work to treat TMD, headaches, facial or jaw pain and dysfunction is to achieve alternating posterior molar occlusion. If we can get alternating posterior molar occlusion, TMJ pain will subside, facial pain will subside, headaches will get better if it's coming from an orthopedic issue, neck pain will get better, shoulder pain will get better, and orthopedic function will improve, okay? Now, if we cannot achieve this alternating posterior molar bite orthopedically, we need to do it with dental work, whether that's an appliance or contact shaping, however you guys go about doing that in the dental profession, right? That's your wheelhouse. That's how we need to play together in this sandbox, okay? In achieving alternating posterior molar occlusion, we need to look at the other issues that may stop that from happening, right? Is that neck mobility that's stopping it from happening? Is it jaw mechanics that's stopping it from happening? Is it breathing mechanics? Is it core stability? Is it foot stability, right? I need to identify as a physical therapist what is causing that lack of ability to alternately bite from right to left on those posterior molars, okay? Again, maybe it is a structural issue and you can assess that as a dentist, right? Is the canine reference or canine guidance appropriate, right? Is there anterior bite appropriate or is it blocking the posterior bite from occurring, right? That's a vast oversimplification of what you guys do. I know that. That's why at that point in time, if my functional programs are not improving my patient's outcomes, I need to refer to you guys. Okay. After physical therapy treatment, dental treatment may continue in an optimized fashion for aesthetic purposes. Okay. After dental treatment occurs, we then need to continue with the stability, mobility, and breathing programs, and then funnel a patient to a long-term strength and conditioning training program. That way our optimal long-term results of pain relief, optimal bite, TMJ mechanics and aesthetics will hold and they won't have to return for treatment because of suboptimal outcomes or increased pain. All right, we made it through guys. Thank you so much for listening to me. Talk your ears off for the last hour or so. Um, those are all of the references there again. You should be receiving a couple of handouts with this just to help you kind of integrate this information into your current practice. Now, again, I am a local physical therapist to the San Antonio area with a, you know, a huge interest and a huge experience in treating TMJ and neck mechanics, okay? And this postural mechanics that we just went over. So if you are looking for a PT to help partner with in this area, I'm more than happy to sit down in a meeting and have lunch and really talk about how we can help each other's patients out and really kind of optimize each other's practices. Okay. Thank you again so much for uh, listening to me today. Again, my contact information is there and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from you guys about questions you have on this and hopefully developing some relationships with some of these amazing dentists that we have here in San Antonio. Thanks guys.